So here in South Florida, I am at Emily Maple's Reptile Room. You know, she works with some of the most amazing crested geckos you guys have ever seen. These guys are mind-blowing. So I'm going to meet with Emily, and she is going to show off some of her incredible crested geckos. But not only are we going to see some amazing crested geckos, Emily has actually been working with these crested geckos for 15 years and has amassed a ton of knowledge about these really incredible geckos. I'm Dave Kaufman, and these are my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. All right, so this is Emily Maple, and we are just kind of hanging out in your herp room here. You have, seriously, some of the most incredible, awesome crested geckos Thank you. <laughs> Ever. So we're going to see a bunch of those. But um, now you work for the Palm Beach Zoo. Yes. And so, so you're a zookeeper. Zookeeper by day and crested keeper by night. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. The crested crusader. Right. Um, all right. So, you know, I see these racks behind you. And um, those are kind of innovative. I love the, the round screens that you have on them. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people have like Exoterras, Zilla front opening enclosures, things like that to keep their crested geckos in. That's how I keep them. But let's talk a little bit about your racks before we see some crested yes. geckos let's here. Let's talk about the controversy that are racks. Yes. So I do have um, racks for ease of care and there's a lot of benefits to having racks. It's easier to kind of stack in um, a few animals. I don't have as many animals as I used to have, and this room is kind of limiting on my space. Sure. Um, but this is a more manageable number of animals. Um, so, like, I have babies and grow-outs in, in one section. These are singly housed adults. I've got the breeding bins. Um, but they, if you're shipping out an animal, it's nice to be able to know if they're pooping, they're eating, Absolutely. and then the bioactive. Sometimes it's a little hard to tell if they're pooping and eating because you have other microfauna in there that are exactly. eating that. So, um, th so those are the really nice benefits. The other thing is you can make a bin, you know, more fun for your animals, and it doesn't have to be a stark um, landscape for them. Right, you can right. do enrichment. So enrichment um, is a lot of private keepers are starting to catch on to an enrichment, but really enrichment does, um, makes an animal, um, do their naturalistic behaviors. So right. It's, it's not what we used to think where you just throw in, um, a toilet paper tube or something so they interact with it. It is more about offering them things to do naturalistic behaviors. So, um, helps them to hunt better, to, um, hide better, to, uh, have a microclimate so that they can shed better. So um, there's those little elements, but then yeah, there's fun things you can put in there like plants or scents or puzzle toys. Even crescents can use a puzzle toy. You know, a lot of people out there think that these animals are stupid animals. That's not true. Absolutely. These animals are extremely intelligent. And even though they do derby things that are fun for us to document, these guys are great survivors and they're very, um, they're very good at climbing and hiding and disappearing That's, you know, into their environment. And as somebody who went to New Caledonia to find these, yes. I can absolutely attest to their ability to hide. I love those types of videos. Oh, and I love you. trying to integrate the wild into That's why like I make this, those videos. So. Which is great. Yeah, this is what it's all about, is trying to get to that next level of care. So, exactly. And, and you can even do that with a bin if you do it right. This is... Um, what these guys like to have a lot of things to hide in, so refugia, um, and then of course you have your different types of um, bedding in there so they can get in there and kind of shed off their skin better. Sure. And uh, the cork bark, of course, is really naturalistic to have like little um, areas where they can kind of wear down their nails and um, shed off their skin and things like that. And also kind of hide in there, so they're pretty good at that. So I see you have a feeding dish mm -hmm. and a water dish. Right. So That's now, also controversial. <laughs> absolutely. So I want to really quickly talk about that is that I missed my geckos down every single night and that I don't have a water dish in with my geckos. So you can do it however you're comfortable. I personally have seen, and there's to tons of evidence of it, there's papers on it, of animals hydrating themselves through their cloaca. 
So having True. a dish in there, and you see an animal soaking, that might be what they're doing. Right. They might be, um, you know, getting hydration. Hydration is so important for your animals. Whether it's spring, which I can do in these bins through the openings, if I'm really in a rush, I can just spray them through there. But it's also nice for them to have a water dish that they can get into. Absolutely. And people don't realize that these guys need to dry out too. You yep. can't just have them wet all the time because exactly. their skin will slough off in unnatural ways. They'll get fungal disease. There's all kinds of things that can happen. They right. need to have that dry period. Right. So right. being wet all the time is not what it's about. But having those little microclimates, like having a shedding box and with sphagnum moss in there and having that uh, water bowl, those little things are helpful for their husbandry. Yep, so the takeaway of that is that lizards drink with their butts. <laughs> um, so yeah. A lot of reptiles drink with their butts. That's true, that's true. <laughs> that's why one of the reasons I admire reptiles. Yeah. All right, so let's see some crested geckos here. This is icing. This is actually one of the uh, first hatchlings that I produced down here in Florida. Oh, look at that guy, you he's like see. lavender. So he's not even like fired up right now, but he's actually red normally but right now he's nice. being right now he is kind of a pink color um he's really a unique gecko uh, for a couple of reasons but the main reason is he was mature at 35 grams in one full calendar year really yes he grew very fast um i didn't pair him that quickly but um it is kind of amazing that some of them grow at different rates uh i don't of course know why he grew faster I didn't power feed him and I don't believe in power feeding animals. Right. I feel like they should get there when they're when they want to and I do a normal feeding schedule about three times a week or occasionally it'll be four times a week. He has some strong genes there. Yeah, you can see he's got some nice um, crests. That's every every crested gecko person wants to have that big crest, crests, right. right? So that's what that's um, one of the unique things about him and then his harlequin markings of course are pretty cool he's got that drippy dorsal and um the spreading cream as they call it yeah no so that is that a, is a really good looking go. gecko he's watching his feet go. all right so let's talk about feeding schedules here for a second because a lot of keepers will just you know have a constant supply of food for them you know they'll put in their pangea diet and replenish it when it's gone right but you don't do that. You do like every three days, you said. So, well, I'll do it three times a week. Three times a so week is what, yeah. So it's probably, I mean, sometimes it probably is the third day. Um, but what I'll do is I'll put the food in and then remove it because you get ferret flies or right, crypt yeah. flies. So three times a week is what I typically feed. And two of those days will be a complete diet or um, I'll do some fruit, fresh fruit. So mango, papaya, like a low glycemic index fruit like blueberries blend that up um, or the Pangea complete because it's got everything yep, in there. Yep, sure does. Um, and then bugs. So some people don't like to feed bugs. You don't have to with a complete diet. Right. But it's a nice added bonus and it's good for, you know, their gut flora to get the That's proper right. nutrition. Plus the enrichment. Right. They want to <laughs> hunt. And I explained in my New Caledonia video is that, you know, fruit is seasonal on New Caledonia. Mm -hmm. So at times all they want is fruit. And then when the fruit isn't available, they go hunting for insects. And that's why they're so successful. That's right. Anything that's an omnivore is going to last. Exactly. If you're a specialist, you're going to die out. <laughs> exactly. That <laughs> so is very true. That's why they're such an amazing ancient species. They've been around a long time. And that's also why they don't get cryptosporidium. That's right. All right, that one is absolutely gorgeous. Cool. We've got a lot to go through here. Let's move <laughs> on to the next one. So this little guy, I produced him, and I've, I've got some lines that have been going for quite a long time. So yeah, there's some raised scales too, which is kind of interesting. So this would just be considered a harlequin. Right. Morph yeah, you can call it a morph. Um, there's gonna be a lot of debate on your video probably right. about this, um, but these guys do throw different colors. There are some way to line breed different traits. Right. Um, but that's the cool thing about crests is it's not like as cut and dry as like some of the Punnett Square stuff that we're right, breeding. Right, right. Which is why I like them, because it's very exciting. You don't ever know what's gonna hatch out. Absolutely. He's just a nice bright color, um, or, you know, stark differences when he's fully fired. It's like black and white almost to the naked eye. Yeah, that is amazing. All right, so when it comes to crested geckos, you have developed a few of your own lines, and yeah. that is what we're looking at here. Right, so this, um, she's fired down right now, but it's usually like an orange color to her, and cream. And so some people call that a creamsicle, but I just call it orange and cream. The crazy thing about it is I had a really brown, 
ish gecko and a lavender gecko that I put together. Of course, back then we were just kind of experimenting. Right. And I always have liked oddball pairings. And then all these orange geckos started hatching out. So there's a few out there. They hatched out with this great orange coloration. Wow. Um, so she's of course not exhibiting that great orange coloration, but kind of cool, you know, like the these guys um, came out of brown and lavender, and then you get these really bright orange geckos. And of course, of course, it's passed down through the lines. Um, and I can show you a baby that's Yeah, I'd love to see a baby. Similar. I love that back pattern on him. Yeah, Her. it's really neat at the dorsal dripping down and all that. That's very popular. Everybody likes to have that. That is fantastic. So I have an LED panel on my camera because it's kind of a little dark in this room. <laughs> so they kind of look like, uh, you know, we're here at night and right. there's no other lights on. But that is just the LED panel for those of you wondering. Very cool. Yeah, let's yeah. see uh, one of their offspring. Here's one of Jaguar's kids. So I like that white tail. That's always something I'm aiming for is yeah. bright white but yeah you can see very bright orange and as they age it does kind of mellow out yeah you're right look at those oranges yeah it's pretty bright i just like this little guy's side pattern because it looks like a map oh yeah all right so that is amazing so this is what you're calling your jaguar line yes and it's a line that you developed here and that is, I, I may have to look into getting some of these. Great. Yeah, yeah. those are amazing. All right, so we've got a bunch more to look at over here in our little crested gecko show and tell. I can already see this one is just amazing. So this is an AJD line. Her name's Honey Bell, but she's got that nice drippy quality to her and um, she's got some really nice crests. That is a really amazing crest. So. And again, look at that back pattern. Yeah. That's neat. So now what are we calling this? So this one is just a, I guess you'd just call it a yellow and cream, but again, people will call that a creamsicle. It right. is not though. A lemonsicle. <laughs> right. So um, what's interesting about yellows too is as they age, sometimes they'll turn this weird pink color and it's just how the color tends to age. So I imagine in a couple of years, like it doesn't always take long for them to start showing that older coloration. She won't look like this anymore. That and is, that's just how, how it is. <laughs> yeah, right. But still, I yeah. mean, and that's the thing about crested geckos is that, you know, as they get older, their colors come out, their patterns come out. Right. And they live a long time. So right. You're going to see a lot of changes in your animal if, if you take it all the way up to 30 years. Exactly. Which is, some of these guys do live that long. That's right. And that's the thing that we strive for. You, you want to try to keep them around a long time because that's what they're built for. Absolutely. Oh, look at this one. Yes, yeah, so this is a rock star reptiles um, extreme, but this is this is what the extreme's all about. So you can see there's not very much of that lavender pattern, which right? is the base pattern. So it is the bummer of these geckos that when they drop their tail, <laughs> that's it. Frog butt city. Frog butts. So they drop them for different reasons. Um, I had a sonic boom near the house one time and a bunch dropped. All of them pop. But, um, but yeah, like I don't have a ton of them that do. And one of the reasons I think is because I house every baby singly. Right. Um, so that can help. And that's usually when they're dropping them is when they're babies or food size, they're a little bit more um, reactive. But he lost his because um, it was a breeding accident. Oh, and yeah. And so he just threw it off um, when he grabbed onto his lady friend right she grabbed onto his tail now let's talk a little bit about um keeping these communally i know a lot of people frown on that correct i keep mine communally i keep a male and a female but i have you know pretty sizable enclosures w for them yeah. with lots of things to hide and both of them still have their tails and right. they breed every year and i feel like something that works for you doesn't always work for the next person it's true which um i do keep some of my animals communally and some of them i've been keeping communally for decade <laughs> that's what I've been doing yeah so space is important but that refugia letting them have their own spaces mm -hmm. one thing that works really great are those little finch nests so oh, I have those so they idea. can squeeze in there and you know they're like the ones yeah. that have like a little hole in the front yep yep one animal can squeeze in there and then the other ones can't get in there so they have their own little like micro that space. is a really good idea yeah so I think it just depends on how much variation you give them in their enclosure like it could be a huge cavernous enclosure and if they don't get along you're gonna have problems so monitoring weights you know monitoring behavior monitoring their weights and consumption of their food 
giving multiple bowls if necessary, that's like two must. foods. Yep, that's what um, I do. Or two water bowls or yeah. whatever. You know, just like you do dark frogs, you have multiple water bowls, so nobody fights over the water bowls. Right, right. Um, so just having the right amount of resources, then you can do it. I'm not saying that you can have like 20 in a tank, but for me, the sweet spot is kind of like two to a tank. That's exactly what I do. So, yep. Or I, up to three. I and keep breeders big, together in the tanks. same tank. All right, so moving on, yes. look at that guy. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, so this is the my dark line. Um, some people call these this color charcoal, but it's really just old school lavender or you know uh, dark gray. So crested colors are kind of unique and weird because we don't really you know and have a uh, green. Right. But some of these colors will look a certain color to our eye, and that's what we kind of call them. So this would be a charcoal or um, a dark color like I'm about to jump but, yeah, right, but this right. is also um, her pattern on the side is that splashed up portholes right this is I, we've debated on this and the best explanation I found is that she's a Harlequin but a phantom Harlequin okay so well, I can see that and and totally like it matches up so um, a lot of the animals that I'm working with in this line have those portholes um, and I think that's kind of spot on because you will get those harlequins mixed in right um so it's, it's kind of shows that that's very possibly what's going on here she is unique her name is truffle hi truffle and if anybody has seen my geckos you've probably seen truffle i did not produce truffle my friend megan smith did Oop. wow that is a good looking gecko <laughs> so you know everybody kind of geeks out about the lily whites and the high white crested geckos man the darks are what i really love yeah and everybody has their personal preference of what kind of you know crested gecko they like but so far i think this one's my favorite yeah so curious we might have to box one up for you then i <laughs> think that that's gonna be happening here <laughs> right yep you take annex right, right? yeah <laughs> absolutely take all those forms of payment all right, we've got one more in our one crusted more. gecko so show and tell. Now the high white, so this is kind of the, her opposite, is uh, seed right here. So I produced this one out of my long line. She's actually related to Rune over here. Gotcha. Which is why they're not paired together. <laughs> but um, you can see she's got a very reduced pattern. And one thing that I have that she has that most people are gonna whine about or complain about but um are able to overlook with her because she's so pretty are those spots mm. i love spots See, i think they're yeah. just like a fun bonus you know like chocolate chips in the cookie i love it spots add character for, I think they for do. me anyway yeah she, i would a, rather have more spots than less spots so she's a funny little potato um, her sister has been breeding for a couple of years she's about almost six years old um and she had just started laying eggs oh so wow i want to say something to the people that have geckos that are not producing right away that is completely okay and geckos are going to go at their own speed and sometimes there's nothing wrong sometimes you know i took her into the vet just to have her looked at and make sure that all of her health was in um normal order and she was good she's good to go and she had follicles forming it's just she hadn't laid eggs Interesting. So sometimes you just got to be patient. Absolutely. And and unlike Icing, who went, you know, in a year, he was at full size, she just took her time. Well, being in it for the long run is actually one of the <laughs> hallmarks of a really good keeper. You know, Emily is one of those people that is kind of a pioneer in crested geckos. She's been working with these crested geckos for 15 years. So guys, if you want to purchase one of Emily's amazing geckos, I'm going to put all of her links in the description below. Anyway guys, there's lots more reptile adventures coming up, so until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.